It's got a massive blade that can be really intimidating upon first impressions, but a miter saw is one of those first tools that a lot of woodworkers buy and can be a real asset to your workshop. Used properly, a miter saw is a great tool to have in the workshop. I think it's used on most of my projects, but where it really comes into its own is when cutting down lengths of timber quickly and repeatedly. If you've never used a miter saw before, then this video is for you. We'll be covering the absolute basics to help you feel more comfortable with miter saws, their features and how to use them. Check it out. So, what is a miter saw used for? Well, miter saws are primarily used for cutting down lengths of timber to size. This process of cutting across the width of the grain is called a cross cut. Depending on the saw you have, there are various different widths of board you can cross cut and also cut different angles at. There are four main cuts you can do on a compound miter saw. A standard 90 degree cross cut, which is a straight cut across the width of the board. A miter cut, which is a cross cut made at an angle across the width of the board. A bevel cut, which is a cross cut made at an angle across the thickness of the board. And finally, a compound mitre cut, which is a combination of a mitre cut and a bevel cut. There are a few key styles of mitre saws in the most generic sense of the term, but essentially you're looking at either a compound mitre saw or a sliding compound mitre saw. And to save a mouthful each time, I'll probably just refer to it as a mitre saw going forward. Now, you may have heard the term chop saw used for a mitre saw, and although that's a relatively common term used among woodworkers, it's technically used by manufacturers to describe a saw used for cutting metal, whereas a mitre saw is primarily used for cutting wood. It's generally very interchangeable, but worth noting when you're shopping for a saw to make sure that you don't get caught out buying the wrong one. This is a non-sliding compound mitre saw. It performs all of the duties you need from a compound mitre saw, but can only cut based on the width of the blade. It also means you can't undertake one or two of the more advanced techniques that you would do on a sliding mitre saw. This is a sliding mitre saw, and the key difference on this one is its capacity to slide forwards and backwards to significantly extend the cutting capacity of the saw, meaning you can cut wider boards and perform things like scoring cuts. There are a few different types of sliding mechanism you can get depending on the saw. Cheaper or older ones like mine have a traditional two bar system that pushes back behind the saw meaning that you need to have a lot of room behind the saw in order to make a cut. This isn't such an issue on site, or if you're using it on a mobile stand, but if you have your setup permanently like mine, then it means that you'll need to have quite a long way from the wall. My interim solution until I build a deeper workspace is that I made a draw type of bench that pulls out when I need it and slides back away when not in use. More modern and higher end saws have a variety of different ways in which they pull out towards you which means that they require far less room behind them. The other key difference in mitre saws is the blade size. They can vary, but usually go up to about 305 millimeters or 12 inches for the biggest ones. I'll go into more detail around the blade shortly. You can also get corded or cordless mitre saws. I've not had much experience with the cordless ones, to be honest, as I've always had a corded saw. But unless you're planning to take the saw to other locations, such as the job site, then you're probably best off going for a corded one as you won't need to buy a bunch of expensive batteries and then need to make sure that they're fully charged all the time. There are some unique features on different mitre saws, but there are also a lot of common ones. They may not all look or work exactly the same, but the principle of them should be similar. So I'll take you through some of them now. First, there's the basic features. You've got your handle, switch, blade, blade guard, bed, and fence. This part is the insert where the blade houses itself when the cut is complete and when it's folded away for transport. I actually replaced mine with what's known as a zero clearance insert, which just has enough space for the blade to go through, but gets rid of the negative space around it, which means that there's less chance of tear out on the wood. Tear out is where the blade goes through too aggressively and literally tears at the fibers of the wood rather than cutting cleanly through. Tear out can often happen at the back edge where the fence is, so adding a zero clearance fence or using a backer board can minimize this as well. You often get some kind of clamp with your saw. Mine is a top mounted one, but some also come with side mounted clamps. These are useful to secure your workpiece in place to keep your hands away from the blade or to act as an extra hand. There will be a knob or lever similar to this, which allows you to adjust the angle to make mitre cuts. Generally, you'll find that there are a series of positive stops that allow you to line up the most commonly used angles easily. You can do a wider variety of angles by using the markings on the base, and depending on your particular saw, it'll range anywhere up to about 60 degrees. To adjust the bevel, mine has this basic handle which you just turn and adjust accordingly to lock off. 
Better quality saws have a more refined adjustment method than this though. I don't particularly trust the markings on my bevel, so I tend to use this digital level box. It's a great little tool for checking the angles, and I'll leave a link to this one in the description. You'll tend to get some form of dust collection option with it, which generally consists of a flimsy little bag that clips onto the dust port and is generally completely useless. I can't show you mine because whenever I get one of these on a tool, I tend to just throw it away. I do have a shop vac though, so I just hook the hose up to the dust port, which then makes the dust collection slightly better, but not much. Dust collection on a mitre saw is one of the most difficult things to get right, so don't be too disappointed if yours isn't up to much. Often, there will be some sort of adjustable sides to widen the base, allowing more support for your workpiece. These just pull out and then push back away when not in use. We'll also see a lot of saws with a light, laser or shadow system that shows where the cut will be made. Mine has a laser and to be honest it's one of those features that looks great on the spec but in actual fact it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. It moves around all the time and isn't accurate at all so I never use mine. You'll often find these features aren't worth having on the cheaper saws like this. That being said, there are some really good ones and the shadow line seems to be gaining in popularity as this essentially shines a light onto the blade which projects a shadow exactly where the cut will be made. Another relatively common feature on a sliding mitre saw is the trenching feature. Mine's fairly rudimentary and is essentially just a screw that adjusts and then locks off with the plastic nut. I then flick the lever which provides a stopping point prior to the blade being put into full depth. Different brands will have various ways to do this but the principle is the same. This can be useful for scoring cuts when you want to score or cut to a specific depth without going all the way through and is useful for a number of reasons such as making a half lap joint which I'll show you a bit later on. You'll often find that the blade that comes with your saw can be fairly cheap quality and end up making poor quality cuts. Sometimes you'll get a good one but it's often worth upgrading it. If you've got a saw that you've had for a while or you've got one second hand but the cuts aren't coming out great, then swapping the blade out with a fresh new one can often be the best way to start. There are a variety of different blade sizes based on the saw itself and all the details about the blade size will be in the instruction manual. Stick with the blade size that your saw recommends and don't put a smaller or larger blade on your saw as this will interfere with the safety measures. Once you've established your blade size, you'll need to know the bore measurement, which is the size of the hole in the middle. This measurement dictates whether it will fit on the arbor or not. The arbor is basically this bit that the blade sits on. It's important again that you match this with the spec for your particular saw. However, it's fairly common for reducer rings to be used for older or less common bore sizes. Mine's pretty old and uses an unusual bore size, which is rare to find on a blade now. So mine's got the reducer rings on it and it does work perfectly fine. Ideally though, you'd want to get the right bore size if at all possible. The next consideration is the thickness of the blade. Again, the instructions will tell you the minimum and maximum your saw can have before it messes with the safety features, so stick with the recommendations. Once you've established all the required measurements, you'll want to consider what tooth count you want. Tooth count is literally how many individual teeth your blade has. The lower the tooth count, the rougher the cut will be. However, it'll also mean that it'll cut through your timber a lot quicker as a result. The lower tooth count is great for things such as framing and general carpentry, where you're cutting 2x4 boards down to size. However, if you're wanting a finer cut, then you can up the tooth count to get a better cut. I tend to keep a 40 tooth blade in mine and it makes a huge difference. Ensure you pay attention to which way the blade should be spinning when replacing the blade. It will be spinning down through the wood and essentially pushing it against the fence. So bear that in mind. You'll usually have an arrow somewhere showing which direction it should go as well. And it should go without saying that whenever you change the blade on any of your tools, you should always have it unplugged. The first thing you'll want to do when setting up your saw is to make sure that everything is square so you can get perfect cuts. In order to do this, you'll want to make sure your blade is sitting square to the bed by adjusting the bevel feature. I'm using my digital level box, but you can do the same with an engineer's square or whatever suitable square you might have. Once your blade is square to your bed, you'll want to ensure that your fence is square to your blade. There'll be some level of adjustment depending on your particular saw, but mine are just like this. And then I use a square to make sure it squares up to the blade. Once you've set up your saw, you'll be ready to make your first cut. It's important to ensure that your workpiece is secure against the bed of your saw and pushed fully up against the fence. Not only will this ensure a clean square cut, but it also means that there's far less chance of the wood being kicked up and potentially causing an injury. The blade spins this way and therefore all the momentum and pressure pushes backwards and as such, 
the fence is a crucial element in holding it in place. You'll see some dodgy techniques on YouTube and the internet for hacks to get different angles or cut wider boards, but you really don't want to copy these practices as they can be really dangerous, particularly if you're only just getting used to your saw. If your saw has clamps built in, then it's a good idea to use them if possible to keep your hands away from the blade. Real talk though, in real life, you'll often find yourself holding the wood with your hands. So just bear in mind where you're holding it and always plan your cut to know where the blade will be traveling before you place your hands anywhere. You'll usually be cutting to a line that you'll have drawn on your workpiece. So you'll need to take into account the curve, which is the term for the material removed for the thickness of the blade. This means you'll want to cut on the waist side of your line to avoid cutting your piece too small. When making your cut, you'll want to get the blade fully up to speed before touching it to the wood. It's then simply a case of ensuring it's fully over the wood before pushing it down and then away from you. Obviously, if it's not a sliding saw, then you'll just be pushing it down through the wood. Don't do it the opposite way by pushing it down and then pulling the blade towards you as this goes against the direction of momentum and can cause issues. A lot of people tend to like making a scoring cut first by passing the blade at a shallow depth and then doing a second cut all the way through the piece. This works best on denser or thicker material as it puts less pressure on the blade and the saw. To cut a mitre, simply set the angle you require, line up the blade to the waist side of the line and make the cut in exactly the same way by getting the blade running, pushing it down and away. To cut a bevel, it's exactly the same principle. Just adjust the bevel, start the blade running, push it down and away. To cut a compound mitre, it's just a case of adjusting both the bevel and the mitre angle, then making your cut in the same way again. Blade running, push it down and away. Once you've made your cut, it's best practice to always let the blade come to a complete stop before lifting it back up. This is because the spinning blade can catch on the freshly cut wood and kick it up, which can cause issues. However, in the real world, people often lift the blade before it stops. So just be aware and make an informed decision based on the cut you're making. There is a time when I would suggest you always absolutely must wait for the blade to come to a stop. That's when using a stop block. A stop block is used to ensure accurate, repeatable cuts. And it's a great way to churn out multiple pieces for a project of the same size. Depending on the length of your required cut, you can either add a stop block to the saw bed and clamp it down using the built-in clamp, or if it's longer than the saw bed, then you'll need to ensure you have a suitable space laid out on your workbench and be able to secure something as a stop block. I've got my saw recessed down, so my bed is level with the rest of the workbench, meaning I can just clamp my piece wherever I need it or simply add a couple of screws in to hold it in place. I generally just use a straight off cut as my stop block. The reason I always recommend letting the blade come to a complete stop before moving it back up after your cut whenever you're using a stop block is because the stop block essentially stops the cut piece from being able to move when you lift the blade, which means that it gets pushed back against the blade and can kick up or even go flying if you're not careful. You'll often find that you're better to keep your cut slightly over the length required and then sneak up on the perfect fit. This means you can get the perfect fit rather than risk overdoing it and having your piece too short. Remember, you can easily cut more off, but it's a lot more difficult to add it back on again. A really effective way to sneak up on your exact fit is to use the blade as your gauge. Each time you make your cut, simply test fit your workpiece, and then if it needs a bit more off, you can just push it against the blade and the little bit of tooth that hangs over the edge will cut a really small amount that's less than the width of the blade each time until it's perfect. A more advanced way you can use your mitre saw is to do it for joinery, such as a half lap. This includes using the trenching feature if you have one and is a case of measuring halfway through your wood and setting it up accordingly. Remember, you're better off being slightly too shallow than too deep as you can always take more off with the saw by adjusting the depth or even using a chisel. But if you go too deep, it makes things much more difficult. Everything I've shown you should give you a good base for starting out with your mitre saw. But if you're looking for a simple first project to build using straight cuts, then I've got some free plans that you can download in the description. And you can watch the build video right here. See you next time.